wait. You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hey everybody, welcome and happy new year. It's 2021 finally. This is TV Guidance Counselor. I am Ken Reed, your host, each and every week where we use back issues of TV Guide magazine to discuss the difficult viewing choices of our collective past and it's brand new year, as I said. Uh, thank God for that. Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, but I don't want to jinx it. Hopefully, I, I, I don't want to say I can't see how it could be worse, but 2021, man. Let's do it. Uh, if you are just checking out this show for the first time, maybe because you're a fan of my guest, in which case you have excellent taste. Uh, I am a, uh, I guess I would say, um, uh, in stasis, um, on hiatus, Boston stand-up comedian here in the United States. Uh, I've been doing this show for almost eight years, uh, since, uh, Valentine's day, 2014. So we're coming up on our seventh anniversary into year eight. Uh, every week someone picks an old issue of TV guide magazine. They go through, they kind of write what they had watched that week in history. And then we talk about their choices. Sometimes it's a little less formal than that. We just kind of chat about TV, what we watch growing up and that sort of thing. Uh, this week is a little bit more in that realm and is one of my favorite episodes. I'll tell you this. It's my favorite episode of 2021 so far. Uh, yeah. Um, oh boy. Uh, but I'm so happy I got to talk to my guest this week. My guest this week is Dara O'Brien and he is really funny, really smart, just a really good dude as well. Uh, one of the good things, I don't want to say good, but one of the, the interesting things about quarantine and lockdown and COVID is that it sort of, uh, forced me to do the show remotely, which has made me able to have guests on that aren't in the same city as me. So I can speak to people from London, had had Joe Brand on recently, uh, and that's why I have Dara on. So if you're a U.S. guest, you don't know him. He hosts a show called Mock the Week in the U.K. He's a very funny stand-up comedian. Uh, he hosts a ton of stuff. Just awesome guy. Just Google him, uh, and you'll find a bunch of interesting and fun things to watch and listen to, and uh, you'll find some interesting things to listen to this week on this very episode. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, Dara O'Brien. TV is my friend, and it has been always there for me in time of need. Dara Breen, how are you? I'm very well. I'm. It's a pleasure to be on. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, the one silver lining I've had with lockdown is that it's uh, it's opened me up to people that I'm not in the same city with. Look, we, we've all kind of noticed it. We all went, oh, the Zoom thing is dreadful. And then we find ourselves chatting to Australia or whatever yeah. and going, hello, how are you? Yes. See, uh, just as long as you don't end up doing gigs down, because oh. I'm predominantly a stand-up comic and I've tried to divert away because very quickly there was a horror story in the UK comedy circuit about a guy who did a Zoom gig that went so badly, he asked one of the audience members to screen share and on their screen, Google him to find funnier clips of him doing stand-up. <laughs> <laughs> so that he could prove to them that he had at some stage been funny. And then as he's doing this, one of the other people said, okay, well, that's very interesting. But um, hey, Mary, congratulations on the baby. And then, and then another <laughs> And he had to just leave the chat. He just had to just scroll down and go. So it's, that's that has haunted all of our nights. Yeah, it's not designed for that. There was a comic in LA who had a like an alt show for years called Seven Minutes in Purgatory. And right. the concept of the show is he'd have an audience in a theater and he'd have the comic backstage performing to a camera so the comic couldn't hear the audience, but the audience could hear the comic. And it was hilarious to see the what a comic did when they couldn't hear feedback. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And that's all I think of. <laughs> yeah. Because I think exactly you descend into madness. I think if you've only your own voice and no, nothing, it's been, yeah. it's been weird for that. Then we do, because I do a show called Mock the Week. It's yes. very common. It's a panel show in the UK and it pops up in BritBox and things as far as I know. The, um, and so we have gone through various iterations. Firstly, they, there's another show, more famous show called Have I Got News For You. They were due to go on first. They did a Zoom episode 
and we were due to come out about six weeks later. Their Zoom episode was so bad, we got cancelled. That's um, <laughs> in the in a living version of the, they were still booing him when I went on. They went so badly, our series got bumped six months because they couldn't, well, we're not going to have two of these terrible things on. And they struggled and they found a way of doing it a bit, but it wasn't great. Yeah. Um, we got back late enough so we could have an audience in and the people had also worked out how to put a Zoom crowd in. And the Zoom crowd has sort of made it work okay. They laugh slightly differently. They laugh in a slightly metallic way. <laughs> but then you can look into their houses. And if you can do like we do, you can do scavenger hunts midway through the round. <laughs> where I sent them off to find weapons last last week. And I said, and then I would come back to them. Now, oh, let's see how our Zoom crowd are doing. And they all held up in like garden shears and some get a crossbow uh, <laughs> and some woman held up the, the knife block the actual with six knives oh. sitting in an angle in it and the sharpener just you know it's very yeah. domesticated but you know as long as it's not nunchucks which are highly illegal uh, listen, in the UK. It, was, it was very much a case of they it was what they would go that was a go-to in the case of an emergency <laughs> we all they all learned something about themselves knife block. But, yeah so i would politely do with the thing so uh next week i think we're going to do um we're going to do battle uh, do that one where you uh, you name whatever that boat thing was. Oh yeah, name, Bodie McBoatface, that thing. No, the one, the D five, E four, oh, battleship, uh, battleship. You've right. sunk my I'm battleship. Gonna, yes, exactly. I want to shout that word. I'm going to get another comment to go E five. Get one of the zoo people to turn off their lights, flash it on and off. <laughs> and my battleship. So we're just finding stupid ways of doing stuff with them. A Mexican wave. We're going to try that one as well because you can do it in the columns. Yeah, uh, on the thing. Honestly, we're just <laughs> trying to entertain ourselves. Which Wait, is but people appreciate it now. And and I, I instantly think like you got your start, like I think maybe even before you started doing stand-up, you were presenting children's television, right? Yeah, it, it was uh, around at the same time. The um, There was very few gigs you get as a 22-year-old. So, uh, so while I was doing my first couple of stand-up gigs, the f- more public thing that I had was, was I was a kid's TV presenter in a very boring, with like not crazy anarchic fun. Right, it's not TV, his like, was. <laughs> yeah, it, not, it was, it was the blue, the driest blue Peter Irish version of blue Peter that had uh, a blue Peter kind of like a magazine show that did hobbies and things and really fucking worthy. Uh, it was really, I was swearing on this thing, by the way. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. No, I encourage oh, it. Yeah. yeah. Really fucking worthy. <laughs> uh, it was, yeah, it was very kind of, you know, like a form of homework. Um, for kids. <laughs> Um, there was a, the fine thing that happened was we once we had a pet clinic and people would bring in their animals and the once there was a pregnant dog and we decided to follow the pregnancy of the dog through because then we show kids yeah. how to feed the pregnant dog and then how to much rest to give it how much exercise to give a pregnant dog and at the end when the puppies were born we would then find homes for them and show how to find homes and it's a lovely item and we did it in, in November we did it in December we went away for the holidays we came back we never mentioned the dog again and then I remember going up three months later we're back to the producer and <laughs> Never happened to the dog and he went oh the, the puppies didn't make it oh. so we just we never mentioned it and like years later i'd be in bars in ireland and people would come up and go what the fuck happened to the puppies <laughs> <laughs> we never mentioned the puppies don't yeah we never that. mentioned the puppies but i'm sorry man i have to sit them down the puppies didn't make it. <laughs> let the me puppies tell didn't you survive. The puppies were all sent to a farm to play with. They always and they're all all gambling happily at the moment. So happy, yeah. I mean, that's I bring it up too because I'm like, I imagine the world we're in now, uh, having presented children's television, would be a a wonderful asset (laughs) in having to try to do some of this stuff because everyone is like a child. Yeah, there's a lot of explaining and and going to rules and and (laughs) and, and this is what you can't do now, okay? So, but look, it's for a good thing. I see you in your home. Yeah, and that's where you'll stay and do your hobbies now. Yes. It's all about fucking hobbies now. It is literally every comic I know, it's about we've all developed hobbies because we're not traveling anywhere or gigging. Yeah. So we're all doing stuff. And particularly there's a it was all it was almost there's like a split across the ages of comics in the UK, which is under a certain age and under like having kids. Let's learn, let's learn TikTok and reinvent ourselves as <laughs> online comics. And then we'll do all these new gigs, right? And everyone over a certain age went. So this is retirement. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm an author now. <laughs> I will. Yes, I will. I will now work my garden for a while, uh, or I will. You know, so I bought a telescope. You know, we all yeah. kind of went. Yeah, that's what. That's what we do now. One of my totally irrelevant to everything else. One of my favorite stories I ever heard involving telescopes um, is uh, a, a friend of mine was in a movie with Jackie Gleason <laughs> cool. from the Honeymooners. And, yeah. And uh, this was in the early 80s. And she, they were like, oh, Mr. Gleason would like to invite you to his hotel. 
And she was like, hmm, all right, just Jackie Gleason, mm, yeah. I'll go. And she's like, oh, he's not staying in this hotel. That's weird. Like, maybe he's just it's Jackie Gleason. He's like, I got to stay in a higher class hotel. So she goes, and he's got this telescope set up, and he's on the, the top floor of this hotel. And the reason was he only will stay in the highest building in every city, and he needs a telescope because he stays up all night looking for ufos <laughs> no that was almost going really really well you could say oh looking for zodiacal gases and in the in the lower atmosphere no looking around the sky yep actively he was obsessed it doesn't, obsessed. It doesn't even work as a thing because you wouldn't you, the ufos would be nearby you wouldn't need it this makes no sense somebody should have sat him down like he claims that he saw the roswell aliens fucking hell jack gleason yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. He and said that who's, no, uh, someone, some president showed him photos of the Roswell aliens. Oh, like as part of the, you know, those White House gigs that used to occur, but yeah. obviously Trump didn't do any of them. So he would do one of those and afterwards as an informal drinks with Nixon. And he goes, listen, while we're here, let's open the files. <laughs> you want to see you, some bodies? <laughs> what are you, what are you, I, you, you allowed one secret. Yeah. What, what would you like? See, I'll give you 10 minutes to think about it. Yeah. Hey, we get the NSA in, we get it, we'll open it up and it'll be fine. Yep. What do you want? You want, you want Area 51? Okay, come on. Larry, there you show, go. show Jackie Area 51. Yeah, yeah. Get, the, uh, get them out of storage. Yeah, so he just all night, and so he just wanted to invite her over to be like, hey, maybe you can look through this, so I got to use the bathroom or something. Can you <laughs> man the telescope? In that moment. Yeah. I was like, okay. That is insane as a thing. The yeah. tallest building in the area. Yeah. Wow, that's really, really weird. What's the tallest have to make hotel? that call. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Gleason needs a tall hotel for the UFO. Are you, are you, are you the tallest hotel that we have? <laughs> How are your sight lines? Uh, uh, yeah, because I, I don't think that's, they, they rarely mention that as a thing. No. They go, well, well, we are, we are Seattle's fourth tallest hotel. <laughs> if, so, yeah. if you're a UFO person. This is the one. Not the nicest you know, you, hotel. <laughs> you will be, you're, you're not going to be the first. We've had them all in. They, uh, so that's bizarre. And and then presumably never saw one for all these nights that he spent staring with them. Not that I'm aware of. The only other thing I heard was that he, I forget what city it was, but when he died, he donated his entire library to this one, this one library. And it's all books about UFOs and like 40 in times and like weird occult things and, like, you know, like chariots of the gods type stuff. <laughs> Oh, Eric von Daniken. Yeah. The um, it would be nice to to make a bequeath that people had to deal with your shit. I will. I would like to donate all of my left sided footwear yes. to the Smithsonian, and just well, they must have a form letter to the Smithsonian where they go, "We come to you. We, yeah. You don't. You don't oh, send you. to us. <laughs> you just keep going We're to not lower, a skip. You know, to lower we, and lower museums." <laughs> They're like, oh, we, we, look, the third tier. we thank you for your kind like, thinking of us in your donation, but honestly, we have a list of people when they die. We contact the family. Yeah. We, we don't just, you know, back it up, back it up, back it up. We don't sift through things <laughs> looking for Dorothy's dress. We got a know? lot of overstock here. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. What, what you see on the floor, like there's even more than that. And we're going to. Honestly, it's, it's, it's take what you want Tuesday for the Smithsonian staff. You <laughs> yeah. just look, if you see anything that comes in, Leave we one, don't think we would. one. Yeah. That's my favorite line in any the, the museum gig is you're allowed one thing. <laughs> you know, just, you know, look, just take one thing, but don't don't go crazy, but yeah. you're allowed one thing. I've had a word with the guys here in the so, I um, mean, if it's yes, England, that's, that makes sense, like because that that's only oh, fair. That's not what they did. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. That was their policy in Greece uh, and most of Africa. Ancient treasure from someone else. You're allowed you allowed one mummy. Yep. You're allowed one mummy, you can bring that home, and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, right now they they are now currently accepting the principle that these things should be in their uh, home countries they accept their principle but they just they just wish to have another <laughs> as and jamie has got it, we just want to look at it a little bit longer they uh it's that's what it's here we so know it's, we're it's, wrong <laughs> yeah but are we accept are we totally accept that are we totally accept that you're right yes but but just find us keeper just while we have it possession being nine tenths we we're just going to have another last you know <laughs> we're just going to run it out for a couple more exhibits but but you are you you're totally right about this it's coming you're totally right it's the it's the Any colonialist checks in the mail <laughs> <laughs> totally, yeah. it'll be there just don't worry about it but you know uh speaking of strange uh foreign countries to me uh when when I asked you to do this, you were like, "Oh, do you have any RTE guides?" Which is the guide you grew up with, and yes, RTE is like the state broadcaster in Ireland. Yep, and there's two channels, right? There was RTE one and two. <laughs> there were two. There, yes, there were, and and for a while there was a portion of Ireland outside of Dublin, let's say, it would be a, would broadly think that only got those two channels. 
and uh, so so they wouldn't get the BBCs and stuff that we the UK television. They all, they get everything now. And I grew up in the in non and so the country was split into two channel land and non two channel land. <laughs> and I grew up in the incredibly sophisticated non two channel land because we also got the BBC. Um, it honestly most of the time meant there was duplication of stuff. It meant that RT was a very small television market, and they utilized this basically to get stuff quickly. And cheap, so they would we would see stuff on the two on the RT quicker than it would appear on BBC. They uh, because of, you know we're not, not that no one notices the fact that we're showing stuff. So you know Jr. got shot earlier in Ireland than he did in England. <laughs> um, the, not as early as in America, but he got shot earlier in Ireland than in England. Stuff like that appeared. So we got a lot of your telly. Um, it's funny. It sounds like they're actually physically moving the tapes because it's like I, I, honestly, I think I think there, re- there was there was betas. There was actually it was it, it wasn't a download. So yeah, so actually, I suppose the plane landed first. It would come from Burbank <laughs> uh, and land in Dublin, get a quick spin out on the Saturday, and then ship to London for the for the thing. You're absolutely right. Presumably, it was that yeah, the, it uh, was. yeah, and on a big wooden spool <laughs> of some sort, like whatever. So so we saw we saw lots of your telly. The uh, and yet and others we saw none of, <laughs> so it's really so it's so and there's parts of your telly would reference other parts of your telly that we had never ever seen. So the more kind of day to day stuff, morning shows and um, news stuff, that's what we didn't get at all. Right, late night, we, yeah. Late night, never got late night. Never, we never saw any of that until late. Some sometimes somebody like Channel Four might show some Letterman's um, or whatever. So, but Johnny Carson. Pff, pff, no idea who Johnny Carson is. You know, that kind of stuff. You know, you'd got none of that, like whatever. And so it's kind of always funny when, speaking as a comic in particular, whenever you see a documentary based in America about comedy, it reverentially speaks about people we have no fucking clue who they are. <laughs> uh, and we've never heard of them. And like totally ignores anything happening outside of America, which of we totally, yeah, and that's just the way you are. That's fine, right? But it's like, but of course, the Smothers Brothers. And we're yeah. like, who the fuck are the Smothers Brothers? Yeah. yeah. And all, like these kind of shows, a bit of a bit of like, um, what's the one with the doors where they opened out Goldie Hawn, oh, uh, Rona Martin. Laughing. Yeah, laughing. Laughing, I think, appeared a bit. Um, and then later we get things like Simpsons, or whatever the, uh, and we got some, and we got sitcoms, but a lot of the stuff that was that was legendary, especially in late night, never travelled. Of course, never yeah. got over. I mean, that makes sense too. But first of all, laughing, uh, you may or may not know this, but Nixon appeared on Laughing. I do know that. Oh. I also know it's a one million dollar qu- question on. Uh, it turned up in a quiz I did recently as well. Oh, really? It it's, was, yeah, but have, a week ago it turned up on, have a, you ever on, seen a, it? on a Zoom quiz. I've not seen it. Oh, no, it's because he is. Maybe the least funny person ever. Yeah. Maybe Trump's less funny and doesn't understand jokes, but Nixon has no sense of humor. And uh, Laughing's just like super bad 60s flower power kind of show. Yes. And they had a, they had a, um, like a, a catchphrase that was sock it to me was like this, like, you know, and yeah. so Nixon goes on and he, and I seeing this one clip, they must have done seven or 800 takes to try to get him to say this in some way close to how it was supposed to be. And then the one they used was as good as it was getting. And he goes, shock it to me. <laughs> and it's like the worst. And it's so, it's funny, but not because, not how they wanted it to be. <laughs> no, he's not. got every way in which to make that not funny in one yep. five words. The, the one uh, line reading. But oh. the late night shows make sense because they're, they're daily. Uh, they yes. tend to be highly yeah. topical. And so, you know, if we're literally like in a pre-satellite world, physically shipping prints and tapes, like, it's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the stuff they're talking about isn't going to happen. So what weirdly what happened was if you were a bit of a comedy nerd, you'd read Mad and Cracked mm-hmm. were both quite big uh, at the time. And there'd be pastiches of television shows you'd never seen. So it was Laverne and Shirley uh, being being done on, on in Mad Magazine. And you're going, I don't get any of the, I, are, these, are these drawings accurate? I, I have no idea. <laughs> is this a real yeah. show? Yeah. yeah. Or is this in itself a parody of something? So uh, so things like that. Laverne and Shirley always holds one of those examples. That, yeah, no, never saw, never any reference to it. Like the, uh, that that would, uh, you know, or there'd be maybe remakes of stuff. Like, I mean, you had, you had Archie Bunker as a remake anyway of a British yep. show. Yep. Some of that, the, uh, but it was, um, so you'd, you'd see the reference. References to, to, to these, and we learned from the comedy references. A lot of you know, comics my age would know would know about American things just because we saw them being spoofed yeah. on things we did see. Weirdly, that's not necessarily unique to uh, being from other countries. In that, 
in a pre-video age, you know, as a child of the 80s, there were a lot of 70s shows that I couldn't right. see. And I would get Mad Magazine and I was a cracked guy because they did monster parties. Same here. But, <laughs> I thought cracked is much better than Mad. Yeah. You know why Mad became the... Yeah. And Severin, the artist was Oh, brilliant. it was amazing. Yeah. And then yeah. in the 80s too, cracked did a very smart thing where they went and they pillaged all these people from underground comics. So like Daniel Close and all these people who were like amazing underground comic artists drew for cracked. So it was like, it had this weird edge, but, um, you know, where you couldn't rewatch these shows cracked and mad were like a way to basically rewatch shows. Cause it was like yeah. printed. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to watch Barney Miller. Let me just read this, <laughs> which was really weird. But yeah, that was the way to learn. And, the other thing is that I've learned speaking to people who grew up not in America is that comedy generally doesn't travel. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. So we send out action shows. So most countries yeah. got like Knight Rider, A Team, you know, even action shows that got canceled after like four episodes, like Misfits of Science or like, <laughs> like that. We just shipped them out because uh, those, you know, people running and shooting. Everyone likes that. Okay, so yeah, cars crashing into things. Yeah, yeah and then, you we know, our that. soaps like Dallas and, and that sort yeah. of stuff. But comedy is so uh, local in a lot of ways that they, they, they don't necessarily travel, which is why we did remakes. <laughs> Yeah, there was um, there were a lot of sitcoms that didn't that you know that, that were made across or, or didn't really impact, and there were local sitcoms because you can make a local sitcom. Yeah, yeah. And so when we were faulty and all these kind of things, the one that one slowly wins it over is that you do so many episodes that eventually the, the machinery just takes yeah. over. Like so, when something hits big, like Friends or whatever, then it's everywhere. But yeah. the uh, but growing up, I'm trying to think of a one that was particular. Wasn't a particular big sick American sitcom, whereas obviously. Dallas was appointment to view, watch view and dynasty equally in a shocked intergenerational. Oh my God. I, literally the words of my mother every week were, I can't believe what you're watching. <laughs> and we're going, I don't want to watch this. You're the one who's watching this because there'd be people in bed together. And yeah. this was in Ireland, astonishing to us, like whatever the, uh, and uh, so, so those things or things that the A-team, like I, I think I'm, oh no, I wasn't wearing, I was, I was wearing a Knight Rider t-shirt earlier, for example, <laughs> all of those things, um, they're, they they became huge or whatever. But yeah, you're right. The, the sitcom really didn't, soap appeared, but nobody got it really. Stuff like that didn't really, WKRP in Cincinnati, I remember yep. being on, but I don't think they were ever really hit hits. And then when you got into something like, I mean, famously, um, Seinfeld and Larry Sanders were buried by the BBC. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even like even in Australia, Seinfeld is on half six every evening, like like The Simpsons or something. But uh, they still go on at eleven o'clock at night. Seinfeld eleven, Sanders at eleven thirty in this weird cult slot that they stuck them into. Friends ruled the roost hugely, and then after Friends, and you got a lot more of the kind of sitcom so so coming through. But yeah, you're right; it is a thing that sort of didn't, and it was a kind of a there was a polished kind of the laugh track era of American sitcoms. Yeah, we got a bit of Lucy and things like that, but but a lot of that was a bit, you know, Mr. Well, Ed. Well, the end. <laughs> Mr. Ed is fantastic. I always say that like uh, the '50s and the '80s, especially here, were like politically very similar. And mm. we got this resurgence in the fifties. There were all these magical being. I have to hide shows. We had a show called my mother, the car. Yes. Uh, you know, my favorite Martian bewitched. I dream a genie, Mr. Ed, yeah. all these shows. And then we had them again in the eighties. We had shows like Alf and, uh, Harry and the Hendersons, which I think was called Bigfoot and the Hendersons. The called Bigfoot and the Hendersons. Uh, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and we had a show called what a dummy where they had a magical talking ventriloquist. It was just bizarre. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, pretty much culturally, if you replace that magical being with a gay son, that's what that show was about. Like, Fine. the neighbors Just, can't I, know. <laughs> I missed that reading of it entirely, right? Because the 50s, presumably, was McCarthyism or something. And yeah. it was like, yeah, yeah. The um, But no, I totally, I'd like the Cladu Barada Nicto. Um, oh, yeah. The, the, yeah, the that, that was all still. about, you know, uh, Reds in the Bed. But yeah, uh, but so that was the hidden message of Bewitch. Was to me, it was like, yeah, something like it where it's like, they can't know. And so that's, right. the, you know, it must read so much differently in other, in other countries when they air. Uh, and the other thing I noticed is like, even our sort of blue collar sitcoms, which were all based on British stuff, like the all in the yeah. family universe begat the Jeffersons and different, uh, 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 different strokes and all that kind of stuff were very aspirational and we steered away from anything that was like blue collar misery and you have to laugh because life is awful. <laughs> 
that's very true. It's another team you do as much. Roseanne obviously did a bit of that. Yeah, Roseanne was the, kind uh, of the last great one that I remember. And the one I love the most because it felt like my family where it was like, oh yeah, we might lose the house. Let's laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, um, Cheers did very well. Yes. Cheers was a big was, was a big thing on Channel 4. Like It was a, it was a mainstay on a Friday night. Um, but yeah, you're right. It, just, it wasn't the same cultural force. The, the other teams that we took from America, because America, when you imagine, when we were in Ireland growing up, was this was the shining city like was this incredibly aspirational place because of the virus we went there anyway right. and we you know and so there was this it was the ultimate destination to go to as uh, to end up in really and there's all uh, the whole thing about visas and getting in illegally and all that was a huge thing in Ireland right the uh, so America was the thing I, when I was seven back in 1979 I went to America I uh, because my I had a uh, an aunt who who'd gone over 30 years and my mother hadn't seen her in 30 years so we went over to visit her in Florida and if you can imagine the, the <laughs> balance of this is a holiday right we spent four days in orlando and two weeks in tallahassee <laughs> so <laughs> the we to- and we did the, the orlando bit first so we had this finest family in, uh, of all time followed by sitting in a house in tallahassee for two weeks sweating and, <laughs> oh yeah and then occasionally going out to but all you can eat and, and a man showed us a Cadillac one we saw there was a man we met who had a Cadillac and a waterbed and both of those were like <laughs> uh, is, what, a, what a life that lived here um, and there were hornets and it was but that's all I can remember from two weeks in Tallahassee my dad just going what the fuck are we doing here? we could have been in Orlando for longer yeah um, but nonetheless, we came back after this trip to America and for years in school, I was the boy who went to America because it was so insanely amazing to go to America. And I'd be asked about America all the time. What was America like? Was it, what's going to happen in the upcoming election? What's, <laughs> what's us, the mood of the nation? <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was so astonishing. So we would gaze upon these shows Partly because they seem very, very rich and, and, and affluent and all that. And also because they spoke of a narrative, a really exotic thing. Everyone had been in Vietnam. You know, the yep. way there was a weird theme to every show. Magnum, a team, Night Rider. Everyone was a Vietnam veteran. was like standard men in their 30s. That was the thing in the 80s. That was so everybody had that backstory that we didn't obviously didn't understand at all, but right. it was always there uh, as a thing. Things like that we, we learned through the fact that fucking the 80s. Yeah, he's having the, a flashback. Yeah. 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 Hanoi got mentioned or something like that. We had no idea what any of that meant. But your stories were the most exciting stories. Um, and we just absolutely just gobbled them up. Like it was the most incredible thing. The weirdest thing about Vietnam, well, that's an odd statement, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> was it, it, it really affected everyone here because it was the first televised war we had. Right. And America traditionally was so sanitized for war and propaganda. And I think the rest of the world got that stuff way earlier (laughs) and had a lot more death and destruction on television. And so in the six from 65 to 75, literally during the evening news, while people were eating dinner, there was like dead bodies and people getting shot. No one had ever seen that on TV before. So it, it sort of haunted the media that came after it for like two generations yeah, because of that. you can see you can see that all right. By the way, the reason isn't that it was, that we had televised wars is that wars took place within. You actually had wars, had wars actually <laughs> yeah. on, the, on that. Whereas your wars, you were in wars, obviously and very yeah. nobly, but they were three thousand miles away, and there was no kind of you know short yeah. of Frank Kappa sending over a few photographs. There wasn't really the same. Whereas France can point to yeah. fucking fields of dead bodies. So yes, you, you I suppose you didn't have that psychic um, scar. Uh, that obviously places that where the battlegrounds had yeah. the, uh, of, of knowing these things. So the, yeah, so that would the immediate of it, I think, was much more clear in Europe than it was in America. The, uh, so yes, watching you come to that late, whereas previously been it had been heroic narratives and missing and and, and greatest generation stuff. Yes. although I presume they weren't called the greatest generation for a while after until I think no, I think they gave themselves that name. <laughs> Fair do so. Yeah, now I the, remember the greatest generation. Nice to yeah, me, that guy, that guy. We were over there. Yeah. It wasn't for us. You'd still be. There's a, a, a funny line that a friend of mine has go uh, where he's, any time goes. Uh, uh, it wasn't for us. You'd be, you'd still be speaking German, and he says, "Oh, I think we'd still be struggling with this." To be honest, <laughs> we'd be, <laughs> we'd be, we'd be speaking speaking in a German accent and going "Mein Herr" at yeah. the end of sentences. But I think we wouldn't have mastered it yet. No. 
So, no, we would have had some sort of mashup here. Yeah, we'd have found some sort of Creole. Was there any show? Because, like, I, obviously, not having grown up in Ireland uh, in mm-hmm. the 70s and 80s, my view of it is from shows like Bridget and Eamon or <laughs> like. Jesus, Moonboy, well know? done. Very yeah. good. You're bang up today. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I don't know how accurate that is. But <laughs> it's not it's not documentary style. I yeah. it's, 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 it is it is quite a broad comedy, but the uh, but they're quite great those two, yeah. I love that show. Like I that's like one of my in the last year like shows I've discovered that I just told everyone like this is so fun, especially growing up here in Boston because it's sort of similar <laughs> a lot of the it's aesthetic. Well, we we have this thing that while we we recognize the, our relationship with you and and uh, and are very you know it, it's intriguing to us like whatever and seeing people over or whatever. The Irish are secretly aren't, aren't are a bit graceless in some ways about the uh, the diaspora in a kind of a look come over here and spend money, but actually yeah. we don't feel. But part of the the reason for that is that. Um, Habitually, Irishness is discussed in American media, and it's not Irishness; it's it's Irish Americanness yes. as a as an entity, right? Because, and I think I've been tr- always struggled to find a way to explain that doesn't seem as if I'm pushing away right. people who who like to identify as Irish, um, in some sort of poshness. Well, I'm Irish, Irish, yeah. in a way. I mean, I live in London for Christ's sake, but still, you know, being born and raised in Ireland, ha- you have a you have a different language about yourself than Irish Americans do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think. Probably the best one is that Irish Americans define their Irishness in opposition to other immigrant communities. Yes. That was p- part of what you do, right? So the Irish Americans define themselves in opposition to the Italians, let's say, right? Whereas actual Irish people haven't had to define themselves opposite to the Italians ever because they're fucking miles away. Yeah. And that's not a thing we ever, we, we don't interact daily on the same streets. So the, I, I have no idea what the Italians are up to at any given time. The, uh, but the Italian, I see why that was such a big thing. The Italian community, the Jewish community, whatever. We were just defined in in opposition to the English. Yeah. And that is a very different thing. So the forces that define, like I hear this, Conan O'Brien is a very, very good podcast, which I enjoy enormously, but will casually say, well, the thing about the Irish is, and I'll actually go, okay, no, there was Zach Galifianakis was on one week and he said, uh, and I, you know, he said, uh, oh, of course, there's huge mental health problems among the Irish. And they're going, no, they really are. <laughs> this, this stuff is just thrown out. Our huge drinking, yeah. our huge mental health problems. Are, so it, what you see as Irish is, to the Irish, is, is a whole, it's a whole other cultural thing. Yeah. They, uh, and we can see some echoes in it. And it's, and I should never push it away because I can see the fellow feeling you want to create. But I suppose we speed it, see the differences as much as we see their resemblance. Well, it's like an evolutionary chart. Like at some point they branched off. It's, you know it does I mean? fit, it's yeah. a, They have common, yeah. common ancestors, but they, it's still a different thing now. And like, it's, you know, growing up here where, yes, it's, uh, I, I, my grandfather was from Norway. And so I used to have a bit in my set where I was like, you know, when I was a kid, it would be like kickball games. It'd be like Irish versus Italian. Uh, Ken, you're the ref. You know, because it's like I didn't have that weird uh, ethnic identity thing because my army yes, was all American. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I was in a punk band in the 90s and we started with the Dropkick Murphys. So that should tell you everything. Right. Uh, yes. You okay. Well, um, and so there was a lot of like kids who grew up in Southie. And I, my favorite thing was when they would go visit Ireland and when they got back, they would always be so disappointed. And just, I loved hearing about it because they'd be like, yeah. kid, they're not even fucking like Irish over there anymore. Like I was like, give me corned beef and cabbage. And they're like, what's that? And I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm like, that's a Jewish food. That um, they get, it's American, and they'd be like, "Why?" Like it's just total. They did none of. No one in Dublin had pictures of JFK in the house. <laughs> yeah, like, we got over that. <laughs> I mean, there was a, don't worry, there was a lot of time for JFK. There was, a, yeah. there was, but we sort of moved on, like as as you do. The I remember working in in an air, in Logan Airport in Boston, nineteen ninety two, on a on a visa, and uh, this is more story about it. Uh, there was an, a uh, young lady there, Italian American young lady, and she went back to Italy, she said, uh, for thing. And her first was like, she came back, this is like July, she went over, and she came back in mid July, and she said, they don't even celebrate Independence Day there. And like, <laughs> it's not, why would they celebrate your Independence Day? They uh, was totally taken back by that Italy, the Italy, which is completely different to Italian America, it's a completely mm-hmm. different country. They, uh, but we all carried on with our own concerns. Of course. They, uh, and some things just got dipped in amber. Yeah. Uh, and then they're returned to us, like whatever. And it's, it's weird. And we occasionally find ourselves pandering to that, like Paddy's Day and stuff like that, the, uh, um, where we created a festival in your image, essentially. 
because you did a much better job of making it a festival. So we went, oh, fucking hell, we're, we're getting left <laughs> behind here. So we started doing giant fucking marching bands and things in the streets. And, you know, there was a, a doer parade, a boring, slow parade or whatever. But the, uh, but it was, it was, then we thought, fuck, the Americans are actually just slightly just, just shocked by how <laughs> not a thing it is. So yeah. we better fucking raise our game and turn it into a whole festival. Certain things about it. Dropkick Murphys never, never traveled. We have no. lots of traditional music. We don't, Dropkick Murphys. I, I couldn't even guess what genre they were really. Yeah. Um, whereas um, House of Pain, that fucking song is is really kicked huge, yeah. enormous. Less so Shamrocks and Shenanigans. Danny Boy O'Connor's been on the show and he's he grew up in Burbank <laughs> from House of Pain. You know, like it's, but that makes sense. It's just, I, I always wonder, like if you were going to show somebody a TV show that best represented your youth or that oh. felt the most like, yeah, this, this is it. Is there anything? Well, hang on. It, one that accurately represented what my youth was or the one, the one that we all aspired to would have been, the A-team was probably the scene. Well, yeah, I, was, well, I yeah, should hope the A-team didn't accurately represent your youth. No, it didn't. It, <laughs> it didn't, but it was, it was, it was the, the escape has been love that we yeah, all yeah. wanted. If you want to be, um, a definitively Irish television program, the one that that was basically there for entire things, and there is no equivalent thereof, um, is a show called The Late Late Show. Okay, and The Late Late Show ran has continues to run after about sixty years. It's only had three hosts, and it runs. It's in some ways you say it'd be like the Tonight Show, except it's fucking two and a half hours long. <laughs> Um, it's on every Friday night. Um, it's so even my wife is British. We, she was over. We were over. My family were all sitting up chatting one evening, and she turns and points to tell you at half eleven and goes, "Is that the same program?" I said, "Yes, it's on for the entire Friday night, right?" And so it was the nation talking to itself. There was all the first major sex scandals partly brewed by this show, and 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 because people would come on and talk openly about stuff, and it was shocking in the extreme, and it was kind of slightly progressive but also slightly conservative. It was a really weird mix of stuff, like, but it was the nation very much talking to itself. Its host died last year, and it was a kind of day of mourning. The uh, he had long retired. The uh, but for example, they're doing a thing called the Toy Show. And the toy show is literally where they turn the entire show over to showing toys. And it's on like the last Friday in November and they do an hour and a half of television and they go, look, this toy, and then, or you could have this toy with that toy. And people just, the entire nation watches it. Uh, and it's, it feels like, yeah, I can get why in the seventies it was very aspirational because these are things you couldn't get. You'd get one of these maybe, and yet you're showing all this. So now it's a much richer country and all that. But still, there's a, they and they're performing kids singing and dancing, <laughs> and then they've you know sick kids or they've break kids or they've got spiky weird kids who are kind of interesting and fun, and they all become huge heroes in the country for like a week. And but the whole show goes on for two and a half hours, <laughs> and then there's a whole running thing that whoever's in the audience, um every five minutes he goes and there's one for everyone in the audience and they always go right because you get the tickets the most and they walk out a big bag full of shit that they get so yeah but the entire nation and also the diaspora will sit down and watch this tonight and we watch two and a half hours of a man my age because he was in college with me um stand next to some children <laughs> small country uh will stand next to some small children and go and why do you like the action man gripping hands doll and the child will patiently explain to him why he likes this or the child will go I would give it 8 out of 10 <laughs> I dock two marks because the hat is too small or whatever yeah. and it's very much and to the whole country watches this and gathers around and watches the children of the country like Ireland is, is small enough to be quite collective yeah quite homogenous about stuff and to, ha to have its own myth that everyone gets the uh, and no one gets it outside <laughs> or gets why it's a thing. Will you but be watching there. that? I I might have a quick tune into it. All right, yeah, I'm, you know, because it's on. I'll see the clips of it. Anyway. It, yeah, anyway, but the yeah, you know, it's there. It was it was a beloved part of our childhood. The toy show was the was the, was the most magical night on television. Just literally showing you toys. Just going for two and a half hours. Look, and look, there, here's a new toy that does it. Here's a car that goes forward and back. Oh my God, we're all. Uh, it does slightly put an image of us being so, he's sitting in mud with a wooden toy, looking good. <gasps> Just Mr. Potato Head, shiny. that's a potato. <laughs> yeah, look, that's on. all we have. We carve different faces, literally. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but then now look at it. You can, yeah. Um, but it, it's, it remains this thing. It remains this, it's this right every year and they're doing it a year on, under COVID which is all very interesting and stuff so they have to be two minutes and, but, and there's no audience which is the thing there's nobody going Yay, and walking around <laughs> in a big bag and stuff but it is definitely there is no version of it anywhere else no yeah. one has ever managed to have a, a, a show lot, you couldn't do it as a one-off wouldn't work as a one-off the uh, you, you have to 
be a long running show that handed over one episode just to this, just to look, here's a new fire truck. Yeah. For two and a half hours. You need 60 years of you infrastructure. You do. You need to crew that <laughs> yeah. in order to just spend it all on just one episode, which is just <laughs> Lego. I kind of like yeah, that, so. though. It's, it's good. Like, even when I was looking at, I, I managed to dig up two pages of RTE Guide. Yes. Um, which I was telling you before that <laughs> I'm able to normally find almost anything, or at least like a full example. Nobody apparently kept these. <laughs> That's, like, yeah, nobody. wasn't worth archiving all of our history, all of our culture history. Nope, we don't need this. Um, and it's interesting because there's obviously the, the, um, the episodes that are in, um, that are, you know, it's Christmas time. So you have like church and, uh, Irby at Orby. Irby at Orby is, uh, city, city, towns and, oh, sorry, uh, cities in the world in, okay. in Latin. Uh, and it's the Pope making an announcement. You may know this. You'd have this, yeah. And so we'd wait because he would say to Irish and he would do a kind of phonetic thing in the Irish language. Oh, and wow. we'd all go, oh, the Pope knows who we are. <laughs> uh, we'd all be thrilled. And like, Pope was did- reading in a list of phonetic things to various Catholic communities. <laughs> and we're just one of them. And then he would say something, and, oh, you are. What country is this? <laughs> yeah, whatever. What are we now? It's just yeah. Dylan, to him. Dylan O'Damus? Yeah. Oh, Dillian O'Douse. Dillian okay. O'Douse. Dillian O'Douse is a children's television program. I don't know if it's animated or not, but like Dillian O'Douse is a kid's song that you learn in school. Okay. That presumably was an under a preschool. I I just burst into, I can sing more of it if you want, but, the, uh, <laughs> but in the Irish language. I was raised to the Irish language. I was yeah, raised to an entirely other language. Yeah. Yeah, I went to whole school, the whole thing. So Dillian O'Douse means nothing, by the way. It, it, it's just a, you know, a kind of a nice phrase. The, that sounds good. Did you know that? So that? Did you know that? So do you? Did you know that? So that? So that? I'm not really helping my argument that Ireland is a modern <laughs> form of nation here. Because I've literally sung, well, we object to Diddly I being the reference. I've literally sung an actual song which Diddly I were the, were the yes. lyrics. The, uh, but did you know that you know would be would be just a, a preschool kids show? Okay, because uh, yeah, that's on so like in the puppets the, and stuff. You know, the the middle of the day on Christmas Day. <laughs> yes. So so I expect these kinds of things. You know, you're getting the Paul Daniels Christmas show and something called Forty <laughs> Coats and Company, and but then you get <laughs> Flash Gordon. Yep. A Christmas perennial favorite, Flash Gordon. That may have been the first time it was on as well. Because oh, like, I, I think that this thing was like 1970s. That would that would have yeah. been, they had a premiere, a network premiere. Do you remember when that was a thing? Oh, yeah. Um, a network premiere of a movie. I remember the year, I remember the year was E.T. I remember the year was Star Wars. The, uh, and they were bigger deals. Than, and then Flash Gordon, that would have been the first time Flash Gordon was on. Okay. Flash Gordon's a big thing. Don't We all get the retro thing on Flash Gordon. I presume we don't explain that. Well, weirdly, appeal. it's it's not beloved in the US. Yeah. But is in the UK. It's, but you know what? Brian Blessed is a large reason yes. for that. He Shouting! Guy. Yeah. More, more flush! <laughs> yeah. he, he remains bl- uh, beloved and therefore as is, and that and Queen. Yes. Because um, Queen, you yeah, know, that's good. But the rest of it's total nonsense. And also, we don't get the um, hideous Asian stereotyping of Ming. Whoa, yes. whoa, 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 whoa! That's. I remember doing a gig in. Um, oh God, was it in the, with the what's the comedy club in LA? Legendary comedy club. Oh, the kind store, of comedy store. No, not the Mitzi Show one. The, oh, the, the other improv? one that had. We, I think so. The one with the wall, brick wall behind you, and then yep. big pictures of like Chris Rock yeah. and Seinfeld. The improv, yeah. Directly in your eye line as you're doing your five minutes, you get to see the king, the gods of comedy, right? And they, they, and I went and said, "Look, we're over filming a thing. I'm a comic. Any chance of getting on?" And they, and they said, "Well, we've got an Irish show later." And I said, well, that seems ideal. And it's kind of funny because the guy said, mm, well, I don't know who you are, so I'll give you five minutes, right? I was like, okay. I, get, I, go, I don't get to hello yeah. at five minutes, but I, I, okay, I'll try to find a tight thing uh, for you. That's not what we do. We don't do the tight sets. Uh, anyway, so I went up and I did stuff. And I, the, I spent the five minutes just pointing to the leprechaun and behind me and going, we don't like this, you know, yeah. this is not, this would be like having a, you know, like a, an African-American comedy night with Huggy Bear yeah. uh, as the picture behind, or having an Asian night with Ming the Merciless. <laughs> yes. Yeah, as a thing, this is not a thing we particularly go for, this, the, the the leprechaun thing, like whatever, but they all laughed long because they presumed nothing right. Yeah. My accent was charming. Yeah. Um, so it was fine. The, uh, by the way, I did seven and a half minutes. I just thought I'd push it. Uh, push it I yeah. thought I'd... What are you going back? What are they going to do? <laughs> you know what? I've never been asked back. Yeah, <laughs> fine. But it was, uh, but it was also the only Irish night, Irish 
coming, in which I was the only Irish person actually on. Of course. And it was just, yeah, there was a very good Mexican comedian on just before me. And I said, that is <laughs> not a normal thing at an Irish comedy night. <laughs> Yeah, it was like, yeah, their, their Irish comedy would be like, yeah, well, the beer is green tonight. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's no, yeah, there was not an Irish person in the room or or, or it made any difference. There just happened to be the people who were in that room and the, and the night. Anyway, so, so yes, why we, flash Gordon. Flash Gordon, back yes. Back, would have been a huge thing at the time and, and hadn't been seen. So that would have been the big, and we'd all gathered around because there's nothing else to do. Yeah. So we'd all gather around to watch in the way that I was did. shocked yeah. how beloved that movie is in Europe and England and Ireland. Like I did uh, a show episode with uh, Flash and, um, and uh, oh my God, I'm missing, I'm forgetting her name now, but who played Dale. So uh, oh, yeah, it was yeah, the yeah, two yeah, of them. Yeah. And just hearing about how like, that did nothing for them in the US. Oh, <laughs> really? His whole voice was overdubbed. That's not no, his voice. No, was that not his voice? No. Oh my God. Like, I didn't even know that till he told me. And then when I, like having spoken to him and then when I watched it, I'm like, of course that's not his voice. But he got into like an argument with them at, at the end of shooting. And so when they did looping, they were like, eh, don't bother. <laughs> So, so who did they, was so, like, so I get that with Darth Vader because you can do that, and also yeah. the guy had a strong Cornish accent yes, and would have yeah, been sounded ridiculous. Been fantastic, but yeah. The um, but um, uh, I'm not trying to do uh, tear the ship apart. Yeah. Uh, I don't kind of kind of say, but the uh, um, but he was he would somebody had to do a really difficult ADR presumably on that. Oh yeah, to get the pretty good job. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know that till now. I never noticed that it was slightly out of sync or anything. But and the, a, uh, apparently, him and Timothy Dalton also got into a real fight <laughs> God, <laughs> which is amazing uh that scene where they're like having the whip fight on like the platform or whatever yes yes dalton excellent... smacked him in the face with a whip <laughs> and he just like got into it and a lot of it's in the movie because they only did a couple takes because they were really fighting and then they like couldn't be near each other for the rest of the like all this i had no idea and i'm like this is fantastic because it was directed by Stanley Donnan, as far as I know, mm-hmm. uh, who is legendary movie director, who I was at a thing at the Edinburgh Festival once on a, on a radio fringe with, with him. And he, they were talking about everything other than that. The, um, and it was like, well, of course you did this. And it, like other legendary films that don't pop into my head and I should Google them. But the uh, but then I remember going, hang on, I looked at you, you did Flash Gordon. <laughs> like, and it's like that whole mood, like, oh my God, you did Flash Gordon. Isn't that all we should be talking about? <laughs> Honestly, the rest, of, well, I mean, bravo for the other 43 years of your career, but like, dun, 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 dun. Yeah. <laughs> that's really all I want to hear right now. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's, it makes sense that that would be like the perennial Christmas movie a lot. Cause like Star Wars here was a Christmas, like a Christmas tradition. They, people watch Star Wars every year, which didn't make any sense. And now they've sort of made it into a Christmas thing, which is weird. Oh, re- well, the weirdest one for us is the fact that you, you love actually is your Christmas tradition. That, yes. That's genuinely strange to us. The, oh, you uh, mean that incredibly realistic depiction of the UK? <laughs> well, yes. And that, and that very accurate representation of love of, of yes. untainted, you know, and un, un, in any way dark or solid or, poorly you know n- no agency uh for the female characters <laughs> representation of love yeah there was yes. that 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 thing which is the least heartwarming movie of all time but the uh that apparently is a thing for you the um no there was it was that would be on the one year it wouldn't mean a stable because stable because the next year it would have been whatever the big movie in terms was. of endearment i don't yeah. know whatever whatever the, the, the next, family favorite <laughs> yeah Kramer versus Kramer. Yeah. whatever the next big hit Ordinary movie people. was in the following year <laughs> yeah so whatever the next, i think so it would have been the, it, the slot they kept the biggest movie of the year for that slot so it would have been it's a it's a mark of to flash gordon I, and I, honestly when you sent me that i looked at him and went oh my god i must show my nine-year-old <laughs> flash gordon Did and you? i'm thinking of course i'm going to show him it's the greatest movie ever made the uh and um, ming's blood was green and he slid off a big spike anyway not to yeah, spoil no, it for it's anyone. a very it's a very entertaining movie and then yeah. and then you get stuck with <laughs> on christmas day 1984 hooper starring burt reynolds and john michael vincent <laughs> Yeah, it's not. I can hardly remember Hooper. Hooper, because Reynolds was very popular because um, Cannonball, Cannonball Run. Cannonball Run, yeah. Yeah, like and, uh, and Reynolds is very popular anyway. He's a, he's a legend. But yeah. the uh, but Hooper, I think always, is he a stuntman in Hooper? I, I feel like he's always subtextually a stuntman, even if Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But this one is like. Oh yeah, he is a stuntman in this one, and weirdly, uh, it does feel like it's it, 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 a writer in his contract that Burton always said the character should appear like 
he could be a stuntman if yeah. he wanted. Yes, I know he's a paramedic working in the killing fields of Cambodia, but he should always also carry himself with the physical, the easy physicality of a man who could have been a stuntman if he Stunt. wanted. I, I might want to improv something and, uh, you know, be stunt. I know he's a professor of, of literature, <laughs> but also roles in a way that in which, you know, this is a guy who could, you know, spin across the roof of a car. If, he's the world's be. leading virologist. Yes. However, if he wants to do a uh, high fall. If he wanted to, he could <laughs> into an inflatable. Pff, pff, that like thing. it's nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Done. Easy. And, and maybe, maybe we can write one in. Maybe we yeah. just write one of them in. You know, if it doesn't work, you can cut it. <laughs> yeah, look, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> he has to get the virology results to the lab. Oh my God, He's the gotta bridge go is over out. This car, it makes. Yeah. Sense. And then weirdly, I, I don't think I've seen this movie, but also it stars uh, one of the first stand-ups in the UK. I mean, in the US ever, uh, Robert Klein. <laughs> It's in this movie. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, Robert Klein, again, some of these, there's a, like a genre of people who have spoken of, like Robert Klein, one of these, but, but in New York in the 70s, yeah. they, that we, we, we adore the histories of American stand-up, even though we've not seen any of the, of the stuff. Well, that's the, how yeah. it works, because if you had, you wouldn't adore it as much. Probably. Oh, fine, okay, correct. <laughs> Robert Klein was okay. Robert Klein was, was one of the first guys, like, that um, he would do stand-up at, like, a folk club, you know, and he was very yes. shit high. Yeah. Um, and weirdly, actually, one of the big, biggest influences on American stand-up as it grew in the 70s and 80s was Billy Connolly, <laughs> especially really? in the Northeast, because yeah, yeah. he would travel with bands here and would do stand-up. <laughs> Like when there was no stand-up infrastructure, there were no clubs and he'd do it at these folk clubs, especially in the Boston area. Like weirdly, there's a bunch of like just absolute shithole dive bars that yeah. like Billy Connolly did stand up like 25 times in the seventies <laughs> at this place. Wow. And so it weirdly like planted all these seeds for like the next decade. Um, but that doesn't tend to come up that much when they talk about American stand-up for whatever reason. <laughs> That's very interesting because, because I mean, look, he came out of he Connolly without getting you know, came out of a out of a, an unpromising circuit, uh, like it was a folk circuit that he came through anyway. So he was well used to beating his own path um, to do to, to do what he'd done. I mean, I speak of how great it is the UK as a place to be a stand up, um, and how easy the structure is. But yeah, that wasn't always the case, no. uh, and there weren't tours that people would do, or the, the model had been set. So yeah, he was he was doing that um, John the Baptist work for some time uh, over, over here as so well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's what a weird movie to show on Christmas and what a weird movie for us to like assault the UK with and, and Ireland with. And then, of course, you get Christmas with the Boston Pops. <laughs> Uh, really? Yes. Oh, that's excellent. That's amazing. It's almost like a bow to wrap the whole thing up. Really? That's very good because it wasn't, again, a staple, but it was. It seemed like a, a perfect filler, like six o'clock, seven o'clock. Was that a... Yeah. There is a, there is a ghost time, I'd imagine, where people are having their meal. Yeah. So between three and six, where I would imagine not a lot of stuff was being watched. Or, sorry, but you say about two and four, uh, where they're having the giant meal. And then there's a sleepy time for, for every, like after that, like whatever. And then it would crank up again. What time was the pops on it? Uh, the pops on it uh, three. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that was that was nobody's dream slot. Right. They because uh, you you're competing you're competing with dinner. Uh, you're competing with a massive turkey like that's taken that <laughs> long to cook. And then there's everyone at the table crack crack pop pop pop. So probably on in the background yes, is the nice programming choice there. Mood music for everyone. Yes, very much so. Tinkling away, a bit of, you know, it's it, the Boston Pops and, and their whimsical take yes. on classical. Yeah. yeah <laughs> the Boston Pops tribute to the Irish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, then, Christ. <laughs> I do not see myself in the Boston Pops no. tribute to the Irish. No. I'm taking a wild guess. Was there a show that you watched as a kid that you thought America would be like the most? And then when you got here, one that was accurate and the one that was the least accurate? <laughs> Oh my God. Um, well, there's, there's two things. Firstly, America is the most ludicrously cinematic country in, in each part of it. Yes. It lives up to its own iconography in a huge way. The, and it is when you get to it, you realize, well, I'm not just seeing Manhattan, but I've seen New England. I've seen New Mexico. I've seen all these places represented on screen somehow, right? The bit that was the most disappointing was LA. Yeah. Um, because you presume that there's something inherently interesting about LA, that that's why all these things happen because it's inherently an interesting place in the way that New York is inherently interesting because of the way that the Manhattan inherently interesting because people are crowded in and all that stuff. But LA was just where the cameras were. 
So that's why their schools are featured, or their um, motorbike police were featured. Yeah, it's good lighting. Or their, yeah, it was, the lighting was good, and it was where there was crews. Yeah. So you was oh, so driving in LA, it's not that interesting a place in and of itself. The uh, but it's just like we, we we make everything here, so we might as well make it about the LA school system, or about the or about LA law, or about it's not that there's anything especially. More so when you get to it, I was genuinely, and this is when I was quite old actually. I'm going, oh, great, I can't wait to get there. Oh, it's actually sort of a big, wide, spread out city. The uh, start the most bewildering though, and I even had this, I did a tour in, in March. Uh, and I'm sorry to talk about your country in a in, in any country because condescending anyway. Please do. So, okay, okay, cool, great. And um, what are you doing wrong? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, no, the, the most foreign thing to us the genuinely weirdest thing and something that you presumably are totally okay with is is neither the cities nor the small towns but the suburbs the suburbs to us are bewildering in a simple thing of well how do you get from here to here like because the car isn't as it's there obviously we have cars but we don't presume it in the same way we're not built around them in the same way but that endless strip of stuff is wrecks our head yeah we when you get over from from ireland from from the uk you just go. How the fuck do I, does that? How would I get? Would I kind of? You can, no one's walking. The sprawl. That's really, you, haven't, you haven't clustered things like like every civilization has in the world. You haven't clustered them together in in. You've instead gone. No, there's a bank there, and then there's a, with a, an eighty fucking meter car park in every direction around it, and then there's another one. You can, is this necessary to have this much space between each individual business? Yeah. And then how do we get from? place to place like whatever partly because it's a voice going i couldn't fucking drink here because you have to drive you can't <laughs> you can't drive like whatever the uh, so the, just the easiness of that w- won't happen but the uh, but the suburbs i find more excitingly foreign than honestly places i've been which are genuinely you know southeast asia whatever the uh, i can get it i can get the clamor of, of hong kong or something like that better than i can uh, I was in, I did a gig, which was not in Chicago. It was my the Chicago gig of my my my, my tour of, the, of that corner of the year. I did Washington, New York, to Boston, and did Skokie. Yes. <laughs> Skokie was my Chicago gig. Skokie, and Illinois. Skokie, Illinois. And you could see Chicago. You could see off in the distance. They you were like- flew into little, it. <laughs> little pin pricks, like whatever. The, uh, we didn't have time either to go anywhere near because in now because of the touring thing. So it was near, next across from a mall- uh, and across some various other random businesses. And I remember going, this is more weird to me. They, uh, because how do you navigate this? It, how do you, what's the center of all this? What's the... There isn't. It's very samey. It's, it's weird. Like even having grown up in Boston, which when I moved to London, it felt like a part of Boston I'd never been to before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, very yeah. similar. Yeah, and it is. Yeah, Boston so is true. when I've traveled the rest of the US, it's, I almost have the same exact experience you have where i'm like it's a giant grid and like you know and and boston comparatively is old like the joke i used to make is when my friends come over from the uk i'm like oh this is our oldest cemetery from 1640 and they're like oh we have one from four um but (laughs) but if you go into the rest like i'm in texas and they're like oh it's our oldest building 1971 (laughs) like it's it's, so even to me it's weird and but you look it, and people from this part of the world grow up to be perfectly normal human beings who have love stories and life stories and do all the normal stuff that we do. And yet I don't know how they literally, how they, uh, the, the management of it. Yes. I don't know. How would you know? How would you get to a friend's house? How would you do? Where would you, where would you meet? Where do you cluster as young people? Where, how does this, how does it fucking work when you've spread yeah. everything out? You've taken this incredible space you've got and gone, fine, let's fucking carpet it yeah. and move everything as far away as possible. That's the most foreign thing. That's the thing that's most weird. It's um, weird. That's why, so, like, pub culture doesn't exist here. Yes, And yeah. why a show like Cheers was unusual and had to be set in Boston. <laughs> because, that makes sense. Yeah. You know, when I, when I point out to people that that's a show about alcoholics, which it is, um, and, and the the fascinating thing is that the alcohol is the great uh, equalizer there and why you have a mailman sitting next to a doctor in the middle of the day. Uh, and it doesn't, I realize when I talk to my friends from Europe or the UK or Ireland, that doesn't read as much because it's not weird to be in a pub at two o'clock, you know, just go meet your friends there. In the yeah, have of a the day. Yeah. yeah. But that's really weird here. Like you have to go out of your way. Not as much in, in you know, New York, Boston, because they are more built like a European city. But that's like a destination. <laughs> like you went out of your way to go there. So it's, it, it's such a weird read that you're like, no, that had to be set here because otherwise it'd be people. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or it'd be totally, 
every every, sick, every soap opera in the UK, the Coronation Suites, the, the East Enders, whatever, the one the one that we had in Ireland, the one called Glen Row, which is set in a country village, whatever. There is a necessary uh, has to be there's a pub, and yeah. the pub is very much the locus of the storytelling because that's the way it works. Everyone would gather at this this is one place that they would walk down to and they would, uh, or or drive to uh, in in previous times, and so that was the local the local even the notion of there being a local. They, uh, which obviously doesn't exist. I mean, look, it's a general thing that, and I mean this again lovingly, the, uh, in America, because America gets very little stuff in, it's very, cause such a huge, self-contained, incredible country with all these diverse things happening, that you develop ways of doing things without any external forces pointing out that the, you don't have to do it that way. Right. And you, everything is slightly, you've committed to it being what it is. You know, we'll, no one chooses their sports teams the same way you do it in terms of things like the draft, which is a great thing, by the way, but but, but no one does the healthcare system way you do or pays that much for education you do or, or presumes that that to be the, the way it should be done the best way. in the same way. Yeah. This is this, but this is how we do it. And you're going, it does, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an exchange of ideas happening everywhere, yeah. but you've kind of set, set off and really fucking committed to certain ways of doing things. How do I get through life without having to interact with anyone? <laughs> yeah, I will just build in the flattest, flattest, hugest, and we'll take, and we'll build massive car parks that yep. fucking size go around every business like whatever. and it's just it's I, it's, it's, it's kind of a tingle of foreignness about it which I quite enjoy whenever I'm in the States the last time I was over we were filming a, a space uh, documentary oh, yeah. and uh, uh, for a thing called Stargazing which I do with the, uh, Professor Brian Cox and so we're doing this thing in, in celebrating the 50 years of, of Apollo and we had a couple of days off uh, and there were nice few things the, in, in a field across from us they were having a Paddy's Day celebration and I walked around and just just walked in a loop around it until felt right at home was, <laughs> oh it was it was amazing it was tears flowing and then found the actual Irish people who had what the fuck are you doing here? And I said, how are you? There you and so I just walked around and just shoved my face around the whole thing until eventually an Irish person came up and said how are you? Right uh, and but on the, I think with the last night, I said, oh, look, I've got, somebody's got to just drive me up and down this strip. I love it so much. You've got to just show me this. And so we found a, a ribs place. Yep. And then we went to an ice cream place where the building was shaped like an ice cream cone. And thank you for being the exact, being the thing I wanted you to be. Delivering <laughs> yet again on your own cinematic promise. And yes, so you ask, I think things, things, are, being, things are, are different to us because we do something differently, obviously. But most of the time, you, you've chronicled yourself so vividly and so much that actually every single part of your country, I have seen it. And when you go there, you go, it's fucking exactly yep. what I was led to believe. <laughs> As advertised. <laughs> Entirely, yeah. yeah. And, and that's joyous in many ways. But wow, it is, you know, from every bit of it, from, you know, fog rising gently over New England wooden, wooden buildings down to Manhattan or whatever, everything you know across the country it's it's, it's amazing there, is there an undiscovered part of it i've yet to not see really no haven't... unless you count yeah, canada you... <laughs> 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 that is a so canada yeah. undiscovered america. undiscovered america <laughs> canada um, well it's always for two people like america and then canada and mexico are like we're in america too though yeah that's that's same. yeah i know we use those interchangeably but entirely but then look i mean we do you know, too <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know but they're 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 their own thing they, yeah, yeah they oh, absolutely own, alternatively own thing going. is there is there something that you think best represents like dublin like if if you wanted someone to be like oh this is what if you watched this and then you came here you'd be like yes oh that's interesting um not there's a lot of it is uh, yeah we we have a thing because we only have 10 representations of us you could list them <laughs> off right the commitments is one yep. and you think and each one of them receives people are happy but also are very guarded about it because they don't want you know like if it's too realistic or too grim my mother in particular is very unhappy that i, I don't like i don't want that to be how they see us <laughs> uh, so promoting the sense that there should be a multiplicity of views has been very very difficult when you only only certain things break out um like for example riverdance is not an accurate representation of ireland but sometimes just the world just takes a thing takes a moment and runs with it you know and then suddenly you're bringing river dancing everywhere the uh so is there the there are normal i mean there's a film that came out last year called dating amber um which is quite a small film but it's about uh two people in, a, in an army camp that they live in the families are part of the thing called the current camp and going kind of a bleak and of windswept flat landscape to grow in 
gay coming out, but it's a school thing. Very funny and very sweet and very nice. And that feels like the kind of, you know, that's just an ordinary small story, right. um, but big uh, in a normal kind of a, kind of a way. So it's called Dating Amber. It's very, I'm sure it's on some platform. The, uh, and so we make films now and there's loads of TV stuff like that. In terms of a drama, there's a, there was a very good drama called Love Hate, okay. which ran for about six years and is our, um, The Wire okay. type thing. Yeah. And that, again, don't know what that's on or whatever. But each of these obviously shows a, a slanted mirror of Ireland and it's very difficult to find the one that you would go, no, you, you really need to, this is the one. I'm obviously missing something really obvious, yeah. some really huge cultural thing that well, I haven't Well, it's hard done. though too, because to, to where we you know, started talking about, like everyone, especially here and especially here, like where I sit now, uh, not in this office, but you know, in this, in the Boston, yeah. um, it is so tainted to the point where it, they're not, their view is not what it is <laughs> even close. No, no, and no. you know, one of my favorite things is we get towny dirt bags here. Like you're, you're gone, baby gone, which is probably the most accurate view of Boston I've ever seen. Right. Um, who any musical group from Ireland is like badass. Like it doesn't matter who they are. So you could have like the most thuggish towny kid being like, Hey, you know, the fucking cause are like pretty fucking good. <laughs> No, no lot like anyone just because they're they'll be like the fucking Irish tennis, they're kind of they fucking roll. And I'm like, I mean, they're really? real, they're really very authentic. Yeah, really? And it's just such a weird thing. And but it doesn't translate to films or, or TV shows that where they're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, that just from there, that's awesome. And it's it's weird. <laughs> Um, the only one thing would love hate is a crime drama, so that is and that has some brutality and toughness to it. I think people is quite gritty. Like I mean, there was five minutes into it where somebody told, "Hey, here the cops are here." So he took out, um, he took out the SIM card and ate it. Oh, nice! And, and Ireland went, "Okay, fucking hell, all right." I'm not seeing that. <laughs> it has the ring of things that they actually do, but that is now I'm just thinking of that that thing passing through his system. <laughs> they, uh, so um, you know that may instantly stamped it as like, "Oh, that's probably you know well researched that that bit." So. Um, but yeah, we, yeah, the, the towny uh, Southie, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for it's us so to navigate. It's so weird. If it's difficult for me to navigate, yeah, I don't they, even understand it. The line, um, was it, oh God, it won the Golden Globes where, um, uh, the, where Ben Affleck was up for something, um, possibly for Argo, uh, and it was, oh my God, what's his name? Tin Fey and, um. Oh, um, uh, Amy Poehler. Amy Poehler. Yeah, who's goes, from here uh, as well. Yes, it was. And said to, <laughs> said to Ben Affleck, "Hey, Ben, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, oh, you're. From, I'm from Boston too." And there's a pause, and he goes, "You're not better than me." Yeah, uh, and yeah, and said, "Oh, he, he, he. Most of his films are set in Boston, but he filmed this one in Iran because he wanted to find somewhere that was more friendly to to outsiders." <laughs> the, that's true. <laughs> I mean, and I, I, I like Boston. It's a great, it's great film, but yeah, it is. It's a, it's a fun reputation you got for yourself there. It's yeah, really it's, uh, it's one that is difficult to crack. Uh, when you first moved to London, was there a, a, a alternative, like a TV show or something that you thought it would be like, and then it, it wasn't? Because that's a, another weird thing. Um, yeah, possibly, but the uh, because you see so much of England uh, on a on a thing. I suppose I didn't see anything. I, the closest to London actually is probably spaced. Yeah, probably when you move over to that kind of flat chair. You know, obviously it's a very broad collection of characters doing comic comic things like whatever. But flat chairs, you know, London is 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 a is an expensive city to you know, and you end up in in weird. Um, kind of house shares uh, and I ended up on one when I had to get one really really fast um, and end up with the random collection of people in a, in a room because I had to do it really really quick before I went away to do gigs in China bizarrely I was doing <laughs> with, uh, and so I had a week to, and I found so the first thing said yeah okay I go fine I'll take it um, and end up in just this weird dysfunctional six one among whom was there was a, a lady from New York who is now a producer with um one of the mate has won nine Emmys or something. <laughs> who's still made a mate of mine go, and she's with like nine, and like, and every time we we're the only ones who stay in touch, like the yeah, because we all went, the rest of these people are fucking mad, yeah. Uh, and and now every time she has a picture, she's holding like, oh, that was for the the expose we did on this, yeah. like whatever. So what had that's how, how did weird. this happen? Yeah, yeah. The uh, so that was it's a weird, but it was it was very bizarre because then you shift from these kind of rough alliances, it's all house share, flat share type stuff. So space is probably the most accurate of, of moving to London. And actually, you've got to say that the zombie one, the opening scenes of the of um, 
uh, Shaun of the Dead or, Shaun or 28 the Dead. Days Later. <laughs> yeah, is, you know, is in some ways more earthly. The, the drudge of, you know, living in the in the endless um, so, uh, suburbs, the endless bricked up, you know, house, like, like it states it's streets, streets of red brick houses yeah. uh, that goes on in London f- for 20 miles in every direction. It's, yeah, it, 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 that was that. That, that to me, I was it. like, how do you know what house it is? They all look the same. They're all the same yeah, color. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's villages and it's also, it's really a case because it's not, de- it's not dense in the same way as somewhere like New York or Boston, I suppose, the, uh, that you move to your part of it and you don't ever go um, to another part. You go, oh, you also, where have you moved to? And they'll go, Grand, you'll go, I will never yep. fucking see you because that is an hour and a Good half luck. and I'm yeah. never fucking going to where you are. Right? There's no just fast. We'll meet in. in nah, no. Well, threw goodbye. me up to like addresses where people would be like, oh, it's uh, it's Dara house. And you're like, what number is it though? And they're like, it's, oh, right. the name. it's yeah, a little bit. Uh, they have their old postcode things. Yeah, so they have, I they have, have their own like, narrowed down now. They, it's uh, like, oh, but, come, come to my house. What's your address? Ken's house. The, that's like, more I, I you must have spent more time with the landed gentry than i did because that is more of a oh you've got to come yeah. to uh yeah. O'Brien manor uh, yeah, yes. which is i had an idea once that we would change the family name when we started having kids that we should change the family name to the name of the street mm. uh and so that therefore it would just be presumed that we were like on the street for generations feudal yeah, lords and, there yes yeah, so rather than it would be much more difficult to buy a manor much easier to deed pull your own name ch- change so that you became the you know the hate sprees of hate spree street <laughs> yes. uh, and they go oh wow you must know oh, you want yeah I said, well it's been we owned all of this back in the day <laughs> funny and story now, <laughs> yes <laughs> so you know but you know we can't won't leave the ancestral pile no uh, no absolutely not um is there uh, to wrap up because i bother you all day and we know you got to watch a toy show is there anything you've been uh either watching in lockdown or like that you've rediscovered or that you've been binging like a uh, comfort the, show the possibly the most uh the one that i keep recommending to people is dark on netflix have you seen dark no. dark is a german language time travel um oh. uh drama three series and in without any spoiler, it pays off. Oh, nice! Um, because there's a point, obviously, as we do in all these things, where we think this is they're not going to, as they say, um, nail the landing, uh, and it's not going to work. So, but it dark is on Netflix, and I presume therefore it's on Netflix in yeah, the yeah. states. Um, but the best thing about dark, I mean, it's brilliant, and you will end up speaking. Watch it in German with subtitles. You have to watch yeah. it in German with subtitles. You don't have to, but uh, because then you end up speaking like the characters um, unter der Schlaufen, unter Flaufen, <laughs> uh, and you end up if you find a dark buddy who you're both watching it with, like whatever, because uh, they speak in very ponderous. Oh, you are now between the light and the dark, between the shade and the night, uh, and you do that in German. Du bist unter der Schlaufen, unter Flaufen, der Flaufen, unter Genufen, and you end up doing that. It gets quite Moorish to do that, but. It, a, it pays off. And B, because it's a time travel thing, it gets more and more complicatedly woven as the series goes on to a, look, I'm just going to, I'm going to let this either roll over me or I'm going to try to keep up with this. But they have a website and I've never seen anyone do this. The official website of it has a slider where you can say how many episodes you've watched and more information fills in on the website. So you can avoid spoilers by simply moving, making sure it's on, or you can just go through yeah and do the whole thing but it's it's a really good so you go oh fuck I'm not keeping up with this and you know, if, if things already been on they've already had all the discussions about it and you're thinking if I step in now I'm just going to get you know I'm going to get the spoil I think go to the official one and you can restart the whole learning oh, process great. but dark is great nothing to do with anything nothing to do with Irishness nothing no, to do you're with you're a big sci-fi America. fan as well right like that's like yeah, yeah. I, I, I would be but like not a you know, weirdly not intelligent as much like whatever but and also we're, we're, we're not like we're not well served by um, by scientific fiction spectaculars these days like did whatever. you watch but, Fringe yeah. at all no, I didn't know. Oh, it was Fringe. So good. Fringe is maybe my favorite sci-fi series of like the last 20 years. Okay. And it was the people that did Lost, J.J. Abrams and all those people. It actually yeah, takes yeah. place in Boston. And it's a, basically about these mad scientists at Harvard in the 60s that broke the world. <laughs> and it's now and they, they have to kind of fix it. <laughs> like, But it's like all these sci-fi and, and it's... It's to your point, it's one of those shows where there are every all of us who like sci fi on television have that heartbreaking moment when we realize our favorite show is just making it up as they go along and they don't have a plan. Uh, This one, they have a plan. And like every episode in series four has a parallel to an episode in series one that pays off. Like it's this long game, and you're just like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, real good. Yeah. Delightful. I will. 
I will check that out. Just watch. I will find out where the, where the hell yeah, that is. That's streaming on something, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Of course. I'll watch, Aren't we all? I'll Are we watch streaming Dark, right now? You watch Fringe. Yes. <laughs> We've had our sci-fi show exchange internationally. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the way it should be no, yes. no, no, no. Yeah. The, um, and at some point by the way there is a if you like science fiction and it's generally there is a website here called Last Exit to Nowhere I think it's Last Exit to no, it's definitely Last Exit 2 I think it's to Nowhere who do they, they exclusively do t-shirts and baseball caps of the logos of companies in science fiction shows. Oh, that's great. Mythical companies. So you can buy a Wayland Corporation t-shirt or you can buy a Nakatomi Plaza uh, baseball cap. Um, or though I've been, I should have, but I don't have anyway, a very obscure one that just says um, Norwegian uh, Thule, Norwegian Antarctic Research Unit with the Norwegian flag on it, which you will appreciate. Yes. Um, and everyone goes, oh, you, and, and everyone goes, presumably because I do these sciencey shows, this must be. And I go, so no, we'll it's the one in the thing. Yeah. That the dog runs from. They were all killed. <laughs> they all died, and it's like it's not even. I don't think even mentioned by name that no. often. It's like it was really passing secret thing. But they melt. They so I for two years been wearing this cap with the this, and no one has ever got it. No one has. No one. You're, you're wearing a reference that it's so fantastically obscure. The only time I ever got because I went to Universal a couple of years ago on the way to doing this filming and thing, and was wearing my Wally World T-shirt, which again they made they're closed. I I don't know. <laughs> If they if what the IP situation is here, <laughs> but they seem to be running pretty you know fast and loose with it. The uh, on the grounds that like what are the are the, are the Whaling Corporation going to yeah. sue me for this? Is there a pile they, uh, of well, unclaimed money that they really want for this? Yeah, you know they uh, and so so they will do really obscure stuff. Um, and uh, it, the game is is even spotting it like whatever the uh, so uh, get on to them. They're great. They're great for all that kind of. Stuff. I got you. Maybe one of the few people who appreciate this, and no one's recognized it yet. But on my car, I got a um a metallic plate that looks like the car name you know like mazda but it's yeah. for uh yoyadine jet propulsion industries from <laughs> buckaroo bonsai oh wow oh, that's <laughs> so fantastic exactly, and is it where it would say mazda right where it was it? it's made out of metal oh. it's stuck right on it looks like it belongs on the car and every time i go in the car i see it and i'm like hmm no one will ever someday i'll sell that car no one will know no, you know what? It, it, there's nothing like it's the Easter eggs. Putting an Easter yeah. egg in your own life. That is that is quite impressive. Putting additional content in, your, <laughs> in real life. Yes, yes. Which sounds like an insult to tell someone to go put an Easter egg in their own life. Yes, but it's, okay, actually, it's actually... It has all the rhythms of it, yes, itself, but actually... It's actually a very nice life philosophy. Thing. Well, thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. I really appreciate you doing this. A delight. Look, I'm, I'm not sure if I totally... I, the weird thing is I'll look back and find the email and go, oh no, you had some weird show in the 1980s that was like totally the bizarrest thing, but it, it, it was obscure. But look, if, if you've got any snapshot of how the dearth of choices that of, of entertainment that I had to grow up in, <laughs> then, oh my God, I, I'm delighted for that. Like that we sat waiting for Flash Gordon to start. Oh my God. <laughs> like we Flash have, Gordon is on in two should, hours. We should have had a telethon here to ship you television shows. <laughs> There are children in Ireland who don't have Give Me a Break. Oh, look, some, some poor child in Ireland is staring at small wonder uh, at the moment now. <laughs> Please, this, can we send them some quality This covers? will affect him forever. Yes. There you go. That's our awesome dude as i said uh my cat just talked and so the dogs went after her but i think they're okay now so it's fine um thank you guys for listening thanks to her for doing the show i'm so grateful that he took the time to do it and i loved talking to him uh, it was just an absolute honor uh if you have guest requests or people you'd like to hear on the show you can email me at tvguidancecounselor gmail.com or can it i can read.com i will do my damnedest to try to get them on the show i'll at least ask i won't harass them uh or you can um hit me up on social media at TV Guidance or at Kenneth W. Reed, R E I D, uh, and I will do my best to uh, to meet your request. Or if you just want to say hello, let me know how you're doing, let me know how your new year was, let me know what you're looking forward to this year. Um, how you're feeling, anything like that. Uh, also, thank you again to everyone who gives to the Patreon, patreon.com backslash TV Guidance Counselor. Uh, it is uh, invaluable. It basically covers all my costs for the show uh, so that I don't lose money on it. Um, but I'd probably do it anyway, even if I did. In fact, I know I would because I have done that in the past. Uh, but we have a brand new episode each and every week. So we'll see you again next time for that brand new episode of TV Guidance Counselor. 
and a man showed us a Cadillac once. We saw there was a man we met who had a Cadillac and a waterbed, and both of those were like, 